Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Avi Fettergreen, a producer whose credits include Michael McGowan's dramas One Week and Still Mine, and Sean Cisterna's Carly Allison biopic Kiss and Cry. Avi's distribution company, IndyCan Entertainment, just marked its 100th release this week with Ivan Silvestrini's high-concept thriller Monolith, playing right now at the Carlton Cinemas in Toronto, and available for rental and sale on iTunes. Avi picked Some Kind of Wonderful, one of the two Mirror Image movies written and produced by John Hughes and directed by Howard Deutsch in the mid-80s. Pretty in Pink came first, in 1986, with Molly Ringwald, Andrew McCarthy, and John Cryer playing out a class-conscious love triangle about a poor girl who falls for a rich boy. A year later, the genders were flipped so working-class hero Eric Stoltz could be dazzled by Princess Elea Thompson, with Mary Stuart Masterson filling in the crier role of the bystander who can't quite believe what's going on. But Hughes and Deutsch found a different ending the second time around, and one that's much more satisfying. And we'll get into it, don't worry. You should also know that we recorded this on, like, the second rainiest day of 2017, and there's a point about 20 minutes in where we just had to stop and wait it out. You'll know it when you get there. Bear with us. This is someone else's movie. I love Some Kind of Wonderful. I mean, I use Some Kind of Wonderful as an example to emerging filmmakers about um, making a really good, emotionally invested film for basically no money. I mean, okay. here's a movie that starred two, three basically unknowns at the time. Um, Character-driven, um, the audience becomes emotionally invested in it. And people can relate to it. Like, we've all been in that kind of position at some point in our life. Um, I feel that it's probably my favorite example of a really solid John Hughes film. Um, Of course, at the time, I was totally in love with Mary Stuart Masterton. (laughs) And at that time, who wasn't? Like, she she was beautiful. And everybody who I... Friends that I grew up with fell in love with her, too. Just as long as... Just at the same time as I did. And Eric Stoltz was that sort of, I could relate to him. He was, he was basically me. And um, I look at this film and I watch it over and over again and I buy the film in bulk. And when I'm meeting with an emerging filmmaker who are talking about making their first feature, I give them a copy of the movie really? as a present and I ask them to watch it with the idea of, this is, in my mind, the perfect indie film. You could make that movie for 50 cents and a cup of coffee all day long Mm -hmm. um, because it's about the idea and it's about the script and it's about the direction and performance. And all four of those things in that particular film I think are super solid. And it's one of my probably top 10 films of all time just because of how it was constructed and how it was in, in the end delivered. And, and I, it's totally relatable to me as, as a, an adult, but also when I was at that age, when I was much younger, I totally got it. I, it made total sense to me. I related to it in every way, shape or form. Um, and, um, it delivered. And, and it's one of those films that is a cult classic now. Like when you, Mention, I mention it to people. People go, oh, I love that movie. I love that movie. I mean, it fits into other films that I like, like Living in Oblivion and and um, uh, Igby Goes Down and right. a movie called Heavy, which is... Um, a oh, Mangold's first film. Mangold's f- her first film, which I love that film a lot. And Prue Taylor Vince in that film is just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, so I look at, you know, when we're t- because in Canada, we're sort of forced to make low-budget movies, not because... Because we have to, because there's no money. Right. And, you know, I, I feel that it, you know, and I tell people and you know, I travel around the country and I do seminars on how to produce indie films and it all starts with the idea and then from that germinates a great script and all the other stuff. But some kind of wonderful, deep down, the script, it's there. And um, the, the way that the actors pr- deliver the script um, even like Elias Kateas, who has this great little role in the film, is one of, is my most memorable Elias Kateas characters he's ever played in my mind, and um, and I think it was his first feature, 
I think you might be right. I think that was his first yeah, feature. Yeah, he'd done TV here. Yeah, right. But I think that was his, his inauguration into Featureland, and um, you know, and then Leah Thompson, who obviously is obviously way more known for her Back to the Future stuff, but played this a really great character who many girls even today can relate to, you know, and so. I love it. I think it's the perfect example of, of if you're going to make an indie film, this is the film that you should fashion it out of. Yeah. It's funny. I've never, I mean, I've never really thought of it as an indie pitch, but it is, isn't it? I mean, it, it's in that there are no effects and no, like all the conflicts are really simple. And of course, it's, when it was produced, it was sort of the gender flip version of Pretty in Pink. And it's almost exactly the same in terms of its dynamics and its structure. So it's like already a tested engine mm-hmm. but yeah uh, now that you mention it why don't we get one of these every two years why doesn't somebody just quietly try to rip it off but i mean if you look historically at the indie cinema i mean first of all you know you could take most of john hughes's films with the exception of like um uh, oh, ferris bueller, uh, ferris bueller and, 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 yeah. and those home alone movies mm. but most of his films you could the, the cast are complete unknowns um, the number of locations are super small. Yeah, yeah. The number of speaking parts is super low. Like it's the perfect um, uh, um, formula for making a low-budget indie movie. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Breakfast Club is the most perfect example because one location, six actors, um, great script, and yeah, all the money's in the soundtrack. All the money's in the soundtrack. And in in he was he did that constantly. Like Sixteen Candles is pretty much the same budget level um, and the same complications. Uh, but you look at this, and and it's all about the story. It's all about the idea of the story, and then it's all about the execution of the script, and then finding these amazing actors who deliver. And it's the perfect formula to make a, a low budget film. And in Canada. We, I think, don't concentrate enough on story and structure and character. Um, and if you took the idea of this and how they did it and, and applied it to most of the films that we're making here, I think you would be super successful. Um, and back then, you know, everybody talks about cast, 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 cast. I don't buy that. I mean, on the bigger budget movies, yeah. But on the low budget movies like Moonlight and, and American Honey and all these other films, it's not driven by cast. It's driven by story and and execution. And these films that Hughes made in those days were not cast driven films. They were idea driven. And the ideas were universal and people got it and, and people, you know, they've become cult classics. If you go look at um, I remember there used to be this great poster store on Young Street. Young and Don Donald area. Oh, they yeah. used to sell movie posters all the time. And they had a section called Cult Classics. And if you flip to the posters, many of them were the John Hughes films or the Bottle Rockets or those kinds of films. Right. They were super low budget that didn't do huge numbers box office, but over the course of time had become films that we ta- as cinemaphiles talk about all the time. And Some Kind of Wonderful is one of those films that we cannot not talk about. Yeah, it occupies a weird space because it's a studio picture that, I mean, it wasn't a huge hit. It was, I think, the beginning of the sense that mm-hmm. Hughes' work for hire wasn't going to be as popular. And then, of course, Home Alone happened, so that upended it yet again. Mm-hmm. But there's this, yeah, there's this incredible feverish output of Hughes from, like, 83 to maybe 92, where mm-hmm. everything was he, was, he was writing so many things that he was rehashing himself constantly like there's a sequence from national uh, no i think it's in christmas vacation that shows up again in uncle buck mm-hmm. where somebody dresses down a store clerk and he was just cranking stuff out and making his own movies mm-hmm. and so this was the second he he wrote this in pretty and pink roughly mm-hmm. at the same time they're they're almost identical mm-hmm. gender reversals gave them to did howard deutsch make both of them yeah he did. Yeah. So nobody noticed. It was fine. Paramount yeah. released them, and they did okay. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until cable and, and VHS, really, mm-hmm. that they became perpetual uh, fixtures mm-hmm. in, in the teen pick. Like, I remember, I don't know how old you were when you first saw Some Kind of Wonderful, but I was 17. Yeah, I was about that. Yeah. I was 17 when Pretty in Pink came mm-hmm. out, and that was... 
that opened like a bomb. That that played. People knew about it. And some kind of wonderful was sort of the dismissed as the as the scrappy cousin. But it seems to have held on better. Like Pretty in Pink. Pretty in Pink is fixed in people's minds as the Molly Ringwald movie, mm-hmm. and this one because yeah, Stoltz had been in what the Wildlife and Under the Mask and mm-hmm. Mask. Nobody mm-hmm. really knew what he was capable of, and Mary Stuart Masterson was a discovery. Mm-hmm. And Leah Thompson was coming off, yeah, Back to the Future. So this felt like their moment for mm-hmm. all of them. And, and the sense of arrival that happens is, is, I think, what keeps it fresher. Mm-hmm. You get to watch... And yeah, now that you mentioned it, it's basically a Linklater movie. Just, well, it is a Linklater. And that's wh- why I find it very interesting, too. Because like, and what's also interesting about Hughes is, in, if you look at historically at his films, he's not using beautiful people in his films. Mm-hmm. He's using... The kind of people that you probably sat next to in high school or junior high, like Molly Ringwald, was, was obviously nothing to really write home about um, um, beauty-wise. I mean, she had her own bit of beauty, but it's not like she's like this stunning. But all of their peop- all the people that he uses, the characters he uses, are probably people that he grew up with. That you know, they're just everyday Tom, Joe, Sally uh, characters who. You, that we all relate to, and you know the 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 storytelling that he does is very simple but succinct, and and the payoff is always the wow, like I mean the payoff in some kind of wonderful for me was oh my god, the girl you were always supposed to be with right. all along was your best friend, yeah. which and, is the thing that Pretty in Pink doesn't do, right? Right, because this one lets the hero end up with Ducky, yeah. who the audience was rooting for anyway. And, yeah. and that, yeah, I guess that's it. This is the corrective to yeah. Pretty in Pink, where it goes properly. And, you know, I mean, look, it's uh, I'm a big Hughes fan, and I mean, m- when you, we were talking about films, I mean, I wanted to do a John Hughes film, and it's always simple to go to Uncle Buck, because that's a classic film I've seen probably 30 times. Okay. And it's, it, it that film... Is it like if I I know it's on, I'm going to watch it because of John Candy, who was amazing, but Macaulay Culkin, who was fantastic, and and just the, it's sort of like the cheap version of Home Alone for him, where he, all those gags that he yeah, does yeah, yeah. in it. But I look at some kind of wonderful, and when I talk to people about making their first film, this film keeps coming back to me over and over and over again, which is why like I buy ten copies at a time, yeah, and I'm constantly awesome. handing it out. Do you have a preferred edition? Because it's been released in so many different... Well, the one that I brought it's today was um, this one. Yeah, so this is the standard special collector's edition, not the Hey, Remember the 80s package. Yeah. Where they tried to... I think the accused got packaged in that way, mm-hmm. which was just vile and horrible. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Um, it's... Yeah, it's it's such a... And this is pretty close to the original poster. It was a poster, right? yeah. yeah. It's You know what? I'm still... I'm looking at it now, and... In a way that doesn't happen when I watch the movie, I am still creeped out by the idea that Eric Stoltz and Leah Thompson were uh, mother and son the first time around Mm -hmm. in Back to the Future. Exactly. It's weird because you get to see their chemistry here and you sort of understand why it wouldn't have worked in a a fantasy comedy setting. Um, Stoltz is just too intense. I mean, the only thing about this movie that I question is whether or not he was the right casting for that film. For Back to the Future? No, well, for this. For this? Okay. Yeah, only because... Um, he's playing this character who, you know, lives on the wrong side of town. Um, yet he feels a little bit more like he's meant to be on the other side of town because of the fact that he's an artist Mm. and he's pretty. And it just felt, that was the only thing that I, 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 every time I watch it, I go, if if he wasn't cast, who would be the perfect guy to cast in this movie? Somebody a little rougher, maybe. Somebody a little rougher. So he's, yeah, I'm looking at the pictures now, and I'm remembering he's pretty well styled for somebody. Yeah, I mean, be. there was a couple of the Breakfast Club people that I might have cast instead of him. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that moment on the street at the end when he looks at Mary Stuart Mastered and you just lose it. I mean, I <laughs> literally, like... I'm, yes, I'm a man. I'm a man who cries, and I'm, to I'm happy feelings. to admit that. That's okay. But I. But when he, she looks at when she looks at him, that's it. It's over for me. You need actors, right? Like you need 
you can't just get by with uh, a couple of attractive people and the and the music. You you actually that was the thing that that was the thing that Hughes proved. I think you need actual performances. Mm-hmm. Um, Judd Nelson is big in the Breakfast Club, but it's big with a purpose. Like he's clearly in control. I think that, actually, Matt Dillon maybe. He could have been Matt Dillon could have been, have been interesting this, although he was a little older by this point well I mean I love him in Drugstore Cowboy I mean that film for me is also one of my favorites yeah but that's like three years later and he's not yeah. a teenager yeah well, Matt, well, Outsiders era Matt Dillon. Outsiders yeah Man. I mean that's a great film too I mean mm-hmm. war, When We Were Warriors and I mean there's all kinds of great films from. I mean I I heart hearten back to the, the 80s and 70s of the time when I feel like I've saw the best films that I may ever see yeah and I wonder why that is and why are we not doing something about it well part of it is probably just that that's when we were kids and everything is newer and fresher but I think story was way more important back then story was absolutely more important in the 70s I mean my god Um, you can look at stuff now that's sort of actively quoting the 70s and see that oh they're reaching back to a time when you could get away with you know, a giant action movie that breathes or a romantic comedy that actually has defined supporting mm-hmm. characters and an interesting setting. Mm-hmm. The, the world is, you know, the world is so simplified now that I think filmmakers are reaching back deliberately. Um, I, I was just talking about uh, War for the Planet of the Apes is a film that it quotes, it quotes 70s cinematography in a way that I found really pleasurable. Just solarization and characters being slightly... It plays with depth of field in the way that the old 70s widescreen films used to mm-hmm. and that stopped being a thing in the 80s with Super 35. And I don't know that there are movies... I don't know that anyone is working on the teen film in that way. Like they're getting squeakier and cleaner. Or well, they're, they're just into... raunchy, like Superbad and all these other movies right. aren't... They're not, there's no real deep storytelling in any of these films like they used to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking of something like The Duff, which is mm. as close as you get to an 80s film, like, because it's deliberately quoting them, mm-hmm. but it's still this sort of pristine version of it. Uh, but yeah, no, Superbad, you're right, they're tilting towards the R-rated as well, but they're losing the conceptual purity, for lack of a better term, that, that Hughes brought, because his films were straight lines. like they were, They were filled with weird little... Well, there's no swearing. Stuff there was no the nothing in them, right? And yeah. and um, uh, every, again, like as a te- as a teen watching these films, you go, I, I totally, I know that person, and that person might even be me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's a girl like for me, the girl who Leah Thompson was. I knew that girl. I knew lots of those girls, and um, you know, you start talking to the screen about. Don't go with him. Go with him, right? Like you yeah. do that, and uh, you know I don't. I've seen you know I see lots of movies every year, and I don't see that in cinema anymore. I don't feel like, you know, as a filmmaker, I want people to go to the theater and w- have a really great experience, and then go to a coffee shop or a bar afterwards and spend two hours talking about your film. Um. And and what the message was, I don't think we do that hardly anymore the same way. And I don't think the, there, there's a deep messages in many of the films anymore. I was going to say there are probably fewer movies that bear out two hours of conversation. I mean, I can think of a handful recently. There might be two hours worth of anger that gets gets dealt with after you watch some of the movies now. But really, there's no... Like, relationship movies, you don't really see the Harry Met Sally's anymore. You don't see uh, You've Got Mail. You don't see these kinds of films anymore. Mm-hmm. And I want... And, and, well, it's TV now, right? Like, that's what... That's well, but what, there's no MOR... There's very few MOWs unless you go to Hallmark. Oh, no, no. It's series mm-hmm. now. It's stuff like, like Dawson's Creek, I think, yeah. took that away. That's why teen movies stopped in the 90s or turned into something else like Scream. Yeah. Because there were already television shows that were, or Gilmore Girls or anything that's loquacious conversation. But I tell you, like, Gilmore Girls, like, my two daughters can't get enough of Gilmore Girls. And when they came out on Netflix, they freaked out. They Mm -hmm. went bananas. And there's a reason for that and why we're not... Why we're not seeing that? Well, I mean, I, I look in Canada, like, we do nothing but procedural television in Canada. Why are we not doing a Gilmore Girls kind of show be- when we know that there's a built-in audience for stuff mm-hmm. like that that would make these shows super successful, but we don't do it? I think it's terrifying. 
I think the idea of... Because you couldn't just do it here. You'd have to create the stars. You'd have to launch the show. You'd have to find the context that satisfies a network, right? I mean, just imagine making some kind of wonderful about in the Annex or Parkdale. You, you need to find young actors who could play these roles and put it all together in a way that satisfies whatever funding requirements you're looking at. Or you have to raise the money, which is terrifying in itself, for a film. Although you're right, you could do this cheaply. But on whose back could you put a giant television series about a mother and daughter in Canada? You'd have to find new people. Well, oh, yeah, listen, they found Tatiana Maslany. Sure. There's, a, there's other, no, there's not a thousand, but there's other Tatiana Maslany's out there that are um, ready to be put into that position. I mean, nobody knew who the people were who were in Gilmore Girls when it came out. Nobody. Mm. And I mean, look at the, it, it just, be, people just got it and they, they, they gravitated to it. And they went, and, so is and it they the, watched. So is it the writer's vision that they respond to in this case? Yes, yeah, totally. I think? And I mean, the, I think the vision of Gilmore Girls is there's tons of m- rela- you know, people around the world that ha- are in a relationship just like they were in. Right. Mother, daughter, um, divorced, looking for that next great guy, living in a community that everybody knows who you are kind of thing. We, you know, that happens all the time. Yeah. But we're, we're, we're t- like... In, in television here, and I don't want to stand on my soapbox, mm-hmm. but, you know, we got to stop trying to be somebody we're not in this country. And we always, you know, we got to be, we got to do it the way that they're doing in the States. Well, if we they did, why are we constantly doing procedural cop shows and whatever? Why are we not do, trying to find the Ray Donovans of the world or, right. or whatever the case may be? Um, we're scared to take a chance here. The, the people who make the decisions of the broadcasters um, want to be safe. Like, I used to go and have meetings with broadcasters saying, why are we not doing anthology? Oh, no, we can't do anthology. Well, why not? Look at how successful anthology is in the States right now. Sure. It's massively popular. Yeah, we oh, can do no, 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 can't do that. Oh, that's, that's a big risk for us. So is it because the old Canadian productions of Outer Limits and Twilight Zone didn't perform to standard and they just decided never to do it again? I mean, there's no reason we couldn't do a Canadian Black Mirror. Well, and there's no reason why we couldn't do an American Horror Story or we could do... Oh, what Canadian Horror Story. <laughs> Can you imagine how provincial that would be? <laughs> like, it would have to be set in 1867 and it would be... But I look at some really interesting, can, you know, stuff and we go, we're just making, like, we consider Heartland the kind of stuff that we need to be making. And I mean, my God. that And now we're doing a Corner Gas animated series. No fault to we the are? people... Yes. Okay. And it's in production, and it's going to be out soon. Nobody tells me anything. And, and I, that's fine. I mean, there's an audience for it. The audience has been built. It was successful. But <laughs> but why are we not thinking outside of the box and creating some really great new dramatic series where there's high stakes? And, and I just yeah, I don't get it. It's bizarre. We have a boom in genre TV. We've got Killjoys and uh, Orphan Black is ending, but it's still made here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what are the other ones? Dark Matter and The Expanse and uh, We're making Herb. Star Trek here now. Star and... Trek, yeah. And we've become yeah. this, the 12 Monkeys, we've mm-hmm. become this base for production for mm-hmm. genre TV. Mm-hmm. And we're making some distinctive idiosyncratic weird stuff that is... Well, more... the strain... Oh, the strain, of course. You know, but, and Gar- the the weirdest guy on the planet, De- Guillermo del Toro, is a landed immigrant, lives in Toronto full time, and mm-hmm. bringing all of his stuff here. Like, yeah, we're doing lots of, but we never see original non studio based stuff of that genre made in Canada. Yeah, it doesn't have its own identity. And you know, listen, Telefilm is not supportive of genre. They don't. They do not believe in it. And so, you know, we're making art films, and we're making. Um, uh, drama and very little comedy. Yeah, and we do one big commercial picture a year, and it's Bon Cop, Bad Cop Two, or, or yeah, whatever. Or whatever. I mean, and it's the same usual suspects that are directing these films, mm-hmm. and where there's a huge um, uh, uh, up and coming uh, emerging filmmaker uh, group of people that are, are aching to sink their teeth into something really, really uh, inspiring, and they're not given the opportunity to do that, mm-hmm. and. We're seeing over 300 films made in Canada every year, of which only 10% are financed by funding, and the rest is either their own personal money or private equity, and that's it. Yeah. And 
there's great films like Some Kind of Wonderful that are sitting on people's desks somewhere that will never see the light of day unless somebody dips into their own personal bank account to make it, which right. is unfortunate because these kinds of stories end up landing, uh, you know, living past the test of time. And, and I go, well, people are constantly watching this film. They're still selling DVDs. Um, well, mostly to you because you're buying well, them. Well, mostly to me because I'm keeping and them. giving them to people. Yeah. But I mean, you know, we're not doing anything about it. Yeah. So, I, I'm just like, is that, is that what needs to happen? Because all the films that are being made in Canada, independently and within the studio system, they're not, for the most part, they're not populist, right? They're not designed as entertainments. They're, like, that's our tradition. We, you know, this is going to overwhelm it. Let's take a break for a second. Yeah, we'll come back to it. Part of the problem is, there re- we get so little money to do what we know we can do really really well if we have the right amount of money to do it Mm -hmm. but when you're trying to make I'll use an example Prisoner X we wanted to make it for a million dollars right had we had a million dollars the film would have been a much different film than what it is at 275,000 but because we went in for a million and Telephone says we really like it we want you to make it for way less there's no in between it's like the middle Middle, uh, our middle is either make it for two seventy five or you make it for a million. There's no yeah, between that you because can't do of five hundred. We can't do it right. because all that money goes to cast, and then you've got no money to do everything else. So we're forced to either do it this way or do it this way, and that's at the the expense of the film. Yeah, and all the things that the director has to sacrifice to do it, and so we can't. Make you know, and so when we show our films to reviewers, I mean, we get roasted because well, it's it was the best we, we could do with under the circumstances. Right. We don't get to see the film that you wanted. No, to make. no, and you know, again, it's no harm, no fault to you guys. I mean, you're you're showing a film, you're gonna tell us what you think of this film based on what you're seeing, and again, that's your job, and and we all get that, and you know what we and we try to show to tell a film. Look, you know, if we had the money, it would be a totally different story, sure, but we yeah. don't. And, and, you know, they only have so much money to go around, so you can't overly beat them up either because they want as many films to get made as possible to give as many people the opportunity to make their films as possible, but there's just not enough money. Right. So what do you... Is it worth... Not worth. Is there a... Obviously, Telefilm exists to fund certain projects more effectively. The bigger films seem to benefit better. Because well, I mean, the Quebec the films are the ones that get the most exposure. Right, because they have a commercial uh, release pattern. Well, plus actually. their province puts a boatload of money into... Mm-hmm. Sodec puts a boatload of money into financing those films, too. And, you know, they get a substantial amount of money to go and take it around places. And, you know, obviously we've built up people like um, Gilles Binu and... And Denny Cote and all these people, but in Anglophone Canada, how many of those directors can you actually say that we've been successful with internationally? Yeah, I mean, short of uh, Villeneuve and Valet and and Fallardo, who were successful enough that they're now well, and what's Hollywood his name for Barbarian Invasions and Oh Arcan, yeah, Arcan. He's, he's stayed here. He's the yeah. sort. He's he's the the example of a, a Canadian. I mean, we have Sarah Polly who's here, obviously, right? But her well, output's pretty small. Yeah, she's only made three features, and one was a documentary, and yeah. then now she's working in TV. Yeah, it's. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're not good at keeping our talent, right? Like as soon as they can, they go to the states or, or the UK because they can make movies there. Even Cronenberg went to you know. History of Violence is an American production. His all his eighties films were made for studios in the U.S. That's not a negative. No, and he prefers to stay here and work. Mm-hmm. But the money, yeah, the money he is raising is mostly coming from beyond Telefilm. And when Telefilm puts money into one of those movies, they're taking it away from something else because mm-hmm. because there's only so much in mm-hmm. the pot. And I just I'm feeling so. This is what I was trying to articulate mm-hmm. before. I every time I see that logo, I know how many compromises had to be made to make the movie that I'm watching. And it would be nice if the film I if it would be nice if I got to see the film you wanted to make. But nobody here's the thing. Although all people like compromise. you need to say that because we say that 
And then we just sound bitter because we didn't get enough money to make our movie. And the and you know, listen, it's hard to get screen space. Like trying to get yeah yeah trying to get a Cineplex to give me a screen to just to release my movies. I mean, I'm a distributor, right? Also, and somebody at Cineplex said to me on the phone, "Avi, we're in the business to make money. Canadian films don't make money." And the digital community in this country is this small. I was going to ask, how does VOD work? It doesn't, days? because you have cable provider VOD that's four-month window. Um, you've got iTunes, which is, uh, funny enough, decreasing. The numbers that are appearing on, on reports for iTunes now are way down. Yeah. All the business is being driven to Amazon now. And mm-hmm. now that Amazon has launched Prime in Canada, I think you'll see iTunes numbers drop even further. They're kind of... I think they're really looking... I think Apple's looking and going, We're, our numbers are way down. What are we going to do? Um, because they are down. App, uh, uh, Amazon's taken a big bite out of their business. And in Canada, that's all we have. We don't have Hulu. We don't have Voodoo. We don't have a lot of these other platforms right. um, that are successful. And um, our population is, is smaller than the population in New York. So how much can you possibly do, Right. So, and broadcasters aren't buying what they used to. I mean, TMN barely buys a Canadian film anymore because, and if they do, it's big, the bigger budget films with big cast and Super Channel, because of what they went through, are starting to make a comeback now, but they can't pay what they used to pay because they have to be fiscally responsible, which I totally understand. But they're, they were, they've been more of a supporter of Canadian cinema than any other broadcaster in Canada. CBC barely buys anything other than now through their Breaking Barriers program. They're buying, they're, they're putting money into films, which means they're broadcasting films. City TV hasn't bought a Canadian film in years. Yeah, do they even still run movies? I mean, Late at night, maybe. Yeah. But I mean, the CTV, I don't remember the last time CTV bought a Canadian feature. Um, that's a problem. Yeah. And we've been, as a community, trying to pose the question to the broadcasters why are you not buying Canadian films and they won't even answer us so yeah um you know Netflix there's Netflix I mean Kiss and Cry we sold to Netflix International which is a big deal yeah um after DHX bought it for Canada I mean you know those kinds of things help and the reaction we're getting with Kiss and Cry outside of Canada is massive I mean people taking pictures of themselves crying and putting it on Twitter yeah that's amazing that's your that's that's your goal right I mean, but that's, when, that's when, as a filmmaker that's yeah. what your goal well, is. when something has a life of its own when yeah. it doesn't require the support system to actually catch on with people and Kiss and Cry is an excellent example of a film that is you know like it's a, it's within a genre that can be marketed easily and safely but it's also good like it's not just a cynical run through that it's really good yeah and but was, that's but I mean I look at that film and I look at a film like Some Kind of Wonderful mm-hmm. for example like bringing it back to what yeah, we yeah, started yeah. with and you look at those kinds of films of that era of the 80s and the 70s and those films today would be just successful if not even more successful today than they were back in the day and they were big successes until they started showing as you said earlier on television and now on VOD and Netflix now and things like that like they're making a comeback and it's interesting to watch um, um, on uh, cable uh, pay TV some of the older movies starting to be shown on Super Channel's old school channel oh, right, yeah. and on TMN's old school channel. These old films making their comebacks now. Uh, a, they can acquire them for super cheap, obviously. Yeah. But B, they sustain an audience. And I, in doing some research recently, because I wanted to... But in research to coming here today, I, I made some inquiries to find out what kind of numbers are we seeing in this kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. The numbers are super impressive. For people watching older films. Yeah. Of the, of, you know, listen, my kids are 20 and 17. Um, they didn't know from this from nothing. Right. And they are, you know, I'm encouraging them when, when they're at home and they don't have stuff to do to forget about the current stuff, like the, the Gilmore Girls and all that stuff. Go and watch some really great old film and tell me what you think. And now my 17-year-old and my 20-year-old daughters are coming back and saying, Dad, we just watched 
uh, some kind of one for. We watch Sixteen Candles, and we watch because, of course, they would never know about them because of how old they are. Right. But they're going. How, and my daughter, my my seventeen year old, said to me recently, "Why are we not making this kind of stuff?" And I'm going. That's a good question. And I ask that question all the time, and I don't have an answer to it. And and even, I'm saying, why are we not doing that? Forget about Canada. Why yeah. are we not doing that in in the States? Why are we not seeing those kinds of films in the States? When we know there's an audience for it. The Gilmore Girls TV shows and things like that yeah, De- are proving... Degrassi. Degrassi here, right? Hugely popular. Why are we not telling those stories? I don't know. Yeah, And it also seems like a logical move for the actors on those shows. I mean, mm-hmm. you could make... Uh, well, isn't that where the lead in Kiss and Cry came from? Mm-hmm. Whose name has just escaped me. Sarah... Sarah Fisher. Yeah. Fisher. And and Luke... Um, oh, God. Oh, that's right. They're both on it. Yeah, both on that show. Yeah. yeah. Um, Luke Bella. And it's the kind of thing... Well, actually, Kiss and Cry feels like an exception to me because it's, it's postmodern in its structure. Mm-hmm. And it engages with the audience in a way that maybe well Ferris Bueller did it mm-hmm. but maybe other films in that era weren't ready to do but how does so this is the question you've you've made the thing you got it made it exists in the world and now it's on Netflix how do you make sure people find it in a sea of tiles where social media is proving very in- interesting because when that film when we first launched the trailer it exploded this is before it even we even sold it to Netflix. It just blew up, mm-hmm. and then when it got into Netflix, this whole Twitter thing, people would like, they you know, they're just scrolling looking for stuff, and they see new releases, and they see this film, and you know the g- girls are w- on looking for content, mm-hmm. and they see it, and then they watch it, and then they tweet about it, and I mean. You wa- look at the Twitter posts. I mean, a pe- girls, literally close-up pictures, right, like, just see their head and the tears streaming down their face, telling people, go and watch this movie. Uh, girls who have cancer, who watch this film and they go, this changed everything for me. Like, that's what these films back in the day did. They changed people's attitudes about themselves maybe they didn't feel good about themselves they watch this film and they go they're not alone they it, it was like it created their own internal call to action mm-hmm. that we don't see that in film today in, in generally speaking we don't have that call to action for ourselves in the narrative world like we do in yeah, documentary, in documentary obviously exactly. but we website. don't have those things like I'm not a bad person yeah. this is proving that right right so is there a Canadian John Hughes model? Is there a way to do it? You can totally, like, like I said, I think you could take a, some kind of wonderful mm-hmm. 16 candles and you can make it for a micro budget. Right. You totally could. Um, does the funders think that this is a film that they should, that we should be making? I would guarantee you to basically say no. That they don't believe that this is the kind of films we've been making, which I totally disagree with. I think these kinds of films are the kind of message films are the films like the films that have been the most successful for me as a producer of the 50 films that I've produced the ones that have been the most successful are the are the one weeks the still minds the kiss and cries Mm -hmm. which are basically although one week was not based on a true story it could have been right um, because many people have gone through that but those based on a true story kinds of films are the ones that have been the most successful for me, box office wise, sales wise, everything. Yet, we very rarely tell those stories. So just relatable, real world human stories. People, the people can relate to, which is why the Gilmore Girls is super successful because people can relate to it. The most successful shows that are not the genre stuff right. are those kinds of shows. I mean, history has proven itself, but. We we don't we don't believe in funding those kinds of shows, and then even in festivals like look at TIFF. I mean, when was the last time they played a comedy? It's true. I was really surprised when the F word didn't happen there. The F word didn't totally happen. Orgy, which is hilarious, it's done super well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sex after kids, like they do not play comedy. They play art films, and then mm-hmm. you see Cameron getting in the media saying, "Well." Very few of the Canadian films that we screened at TIFF have sold anywhere. 
really? I wonder why that is. Yeah, and it doesn't. It's no reflection on their content either. It's just. Well, look, they're the biggest Canadian film festival there is, and they play the least amount of Canadian films there mm. is. Like 28 films total. That's nothing. Is it really that small? Is that not including documentaries? It's not include. That's document. That's everything except for short film. Oof. Twenty-eight. That's despairing. I mean, little festivals like Whistler or Calgary, compared and Sudbury, comparatively play more f- like per per number of films that they play more right. Canadian films than than TIFF does. There's a problem with that. We need to support our own, and um, we're not. Yeah, we certainly have enough product. I mean, well, we're making over 300 films in Canada a year. Yeah. But they don't play comedy. Um, they they v- rarely play genre unless it's like in Midnight Madness. Or well, in the Midnight Madness, 99% of them are non-Canadian yeah. films. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> it just is. What if we got Eric Stoltz and Leah Thompson to be in one? Would that work? They could shoot. Well, what's here. interesting is the girl who I am the most in love with, Mercy Messer, like you never see her anymore. She just showed up in something. And but I was very rare. No, I was stunned to find out that she was still working. Uh, very rare. Which is really weird. I mean, I look at um, one of my favorite films, and actually this was, this was going to be my other film that I was going to pitch you, okay. which is a movie called Creator. Oh, you don't have to pitch me on that. Yeah. But that was one of my favorite films ever. That is a classic for me. And that's a weird, unquantifiable film. Like, you couldn't describe it. You couldn't... I'm sure you couldn't sell it now. It's creepy. Well, you could, because with this whole um, DNA and gene... Mm. Regenerate... Yeah. All that stuff. But as a lighthearted comedy? That I don't know. Well, you never know. I'm thinking of... Oh, and Maria Hemingway was in that film, too. Yeah, it was Maria Hemingway. I'm thinking of the one with... um, uh, Eva Green and Matt Smith. Oh, just, yeah. That was just creepy and weird. Yeah. And you can't get around but it. But there's another film that I look at and I go, wow, like, I would, I could watch that film to, all day yeah. long. Yeah. But we don't make that stuff here. We, we don't make that stuff anywhere, actually. And, and then you look at films like Ex Machina, which I think is a brilliant film. Again, super simple movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super low budget. You could make that film for, in Canada, you could make that film for a million dollars if you had to. Um, but we don't, we don't think outside the box. Like, we don't do that stuff. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's criminal. So how do you encourage it? How do you, well, can you change the system from within or do you? Well, I think it? that what we used to have in the 80s when the, the government allowed private investment, even though that was broken, that system was completely deranged. Oh, the tax shelter system? Yeah. yeah. We need to bring something like that back with, obviously, um, a lot more um, uh, control control over Oversight. what was happening. Uh, because it's the only way that we're going to be able to make cinema. Right now, there's no incentive for anybody to invest a nickel into a movie. Mm. Um and with the government, the amount of government funding going down and down and down and down every year, um, I think, you know, we need to... F- and, and the fact that the matter is broadcasters are not buying Canadian content like they used to for film. So we have to find alternative ways of financing. And I think private investment is really the only way. And most of the films that are being made in Canada right now are private investment, but there's no incentive for people to invest. It's 100% risk. We need to figure out a way to not put that kind of risk on an investor um, in this country. And I think we just need to be smart about our storytelling. I think we just need to be bold about our storytelling. And I think that, um, you know, if if we're, make, if we're making these low-budget, micro-budget films where the notes from the funders are not part of the equation, then maybe filmmakers can, can loosen the chain, the ball and chains about how they're going to make their films, right? And I think we need to take those ball and chains off of our filmmakers to make films. And let's not put criteria on like it has to be 50% women or 50% men. Just let's... let's. I agree, women filmmakers are important, but why don't we, instead of basing on the decisions on, on gender, why don't we base it on who's got the best projects? Yeah. And let's make them. And if it means that 10 out of 10 of them are women directors, great! But at least we know that they're the best projects to be made. Right. And that's what I think we need to do. And and this whole 5% of box office, which we all know is just fantasy, take all of those constraints off and let's just 
do our best and then we need to force the exhibitors to play our films like maybe the you know unfortunately we can't get the crtc involved to do something like that because it falls completely out of their jurisdiction right but there needs to be a mechanism to force these companies to play our films and you know we're seeing a lot of the big distributors falling away from taking on canadian films mongrel who um, in my mind is the best distributor in canada um and you know took three of my films and did everything um but you know walk up and down young street with a sandwich board on it to publicize our movie hmm, they didn't do that well, <laughs> i'm gonna have to talk to them about that but it seems like uh, a cheap <laughs> way to do it too. it's not too expensive but um uh they're not taking as many canadian films now because now you know Hussein has become very successful at the American-based Sony Picture Classic stuff and other, other American and non-American stuff that he's taken. That, that's that business is doing very well for him. So there's less commitment to Canadian stuff. I feel, and maybe I'm wrong. Or it's co-productions like Brooklyn that are shot in Montreal, yeah. but perceived as American films. Well, they're not really Canadian. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. Like Room, same thing. Like mm-hmm. those films, they're great films. I love them. But they're not really Canadian. And for us to take credit and call it Canadian... Oh, I know now. It's like that whole Canadian Screen Award thing where they're competing. It just obliterates the Canadian competition because that's what's always happened. We go for the shiny thing. But the other thing, what, you know, I'm sorry you mentioned the Canadian Screen Awards, but, <laughs> like, like, why are Quebec films part of that? They have the Jutras. Why, is, why can we not have our own English-speaking award? Yeah, I don't know how that happened. Now that you mention it, it's never really been on anything I thought about. But it's a yeah, big they do deal. Have their own, they have their own award structure, yeah. don't they? Yeah. Hmm. But yet they... Is it because they bring star power that maybe the Canadian films don't always? I mean, given that they'll watch we the show... We have star power. Yeah, but they'll watch the show in Quebec if Delon is there or if... Um, well, if Patrick maybe Warren it just says that they make... Better they're, films in Quebec than we're making in English speaking Canada. Well, and why is, is that? They're far better at commercial cinema because there's an audience for it or because well, they get them in the theaters. But that's because the theaters support their, mm-hmm. their film. I mean, and there's dedicated theaters to go and see uh, French film. Right. We don't have, we have dedicated f- theaters that play French language. French, films. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but I mean, you know, we don't celebrate our own very well here when it comes to cinema and the Canadian Screen Awards you know if there's a Quebec film in there I, I it's a Quebec film that's going to win hands down like nobody when was the last English speaking film that won best film I was trying to think about that while you were talking just now um was it the uh, Water no no there must have been something subsequent a bon cup back up there must have, didn't one of the Cronenberg films didn't uh, Dangerous Method win? I don't remember, but it just seems like <laughs> this so is how little attention. I but that's it's, also a studio film, right? Like it's not. Yeah, that was E one. Yeah, yeah. No, you you have a point. They're very very good at that. And plus, we you know Delon's the flavor of the month, so he'll win as long as he keeps coming to the ceremony. I suspect. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's nothing there for me. Um, okay, well, you have a heart out, mm-hmm. um, but before we completely fixed Canadian cinema. Uh, I did want to ask the final question, which you've kind of already addressed, is is there any one thing or element of some kind of wonderful that you've borrowed or lifted or stolen or incorporated into your own creative DNA? I use it all the time. Yeah, you were saying. I mean, I do. I think... I use, And it's not just some kind of wonderful... I mean, that is my sort of linchpin film. Your Rosetta Stone. My Rosetta Stone, yeah. Cinema. I mean, there's, but there's many films, many of which I've already named, like E.B. Goes Down, Heavy... Um, beautiful girls, um, those kinds of films, I think we don't we don't pay enough attention to as being great um, cinema, great storytelling. Um, to me, you know, I, I always and I've said this earlier, you know, if you don't have a good idea, I can make a great film out of a great idea, but I can't make a great film out of a bad idea. And there's lots of bad ideas that are make, getting made as bad films. And, you know, I don't think we focus on the good ideas enough, especially here. And I think if we concentrated on the good ideas more, I think um, you would 
you and other people that review our films would would actually say we're making good films instead of this had all the possibilities of being a good film but it couldn't deliver and and I respect those those comments because they're real and they're honest and we all of us as a community know that we have the ability to make great film we do we and we help the Americans make it Every time they come up here to shoot a movie. Yeah, absolutely. And same with television. You know, if given the ability to do it, we can deliver. We need to be given the ability. And we need the, we need to grasp onto really great ideas and mold it. Don't rush it. It's got to come naturally. I see filmmakers making the mistake of, oh, my God, I've got to make this film in 12 months. Like, but you don't even have a draft yet. Yeah. Like, you have to... Mis- that script has to be like there I mean obviously you're always going to make changes to the script but it's got to be like perfect to go they go after that gold and and make that movie you can't rush it it's got to come it's got to come naturally and if it does then you'll get the money and you'll make a good movie yeah so Hughes was famous for writing scripts in like days. Yeah. In under a week, I think. Pretty in Pink was two weeks and mm-hmm. so some kind of wonderful, maybe just a little less. But I mean, how many people... Yeah, that's true. I mean, in Canada, one of the few... The only director that I... Writer-director that I know that can do that mm-hmm. or I've seen do that is Mike McGowan. Really? I, you know, he... Uh, I don't know what it is, but he can take an idea and craft it into a great first draft like nobody I've ever seen in this country. I mean, One Week was greenlit on a first draft. Skoraki Musical was greenlit on a first draft. Still Mine was greenlit on a first draft. Um, obviously, those scripts evolved. Right. But um, you don't see that. You very rarely see that. And, and then, of course, there's many films that get greenlighted made that should never have been greenlighting made at the at, at all but we won't even get into that because then I'll really get angry yeah my thanks to Avi Fettergreen who's currently finishing up work on two new features Justin McConnell's Life Changer and Gary Burns' Man Running you can catch the 100th release from his distribution company IndyCan Entertainment Monolith at the Carlton Cinema in Toronto or on iTunes in North America right now and by way of clarification Mary Stuart Masterson just had a multi-episode run on Blindspot, although when we recorded it, she'd only done one episode. And there was a recent English-language winner for Best Motion Picture at the Canadian Screen Awards just two years ago, in fact. It was Lenny Abramson's Room, which was a co-production with Ireland. So we're all caught up. You can find Avi on Twitter at Avi Fettergreen, all one word, and you can find Some Kind of Wonderful on DVD from Paramount Home Entertainment. It's also available in HD on iTunes and Google Play. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. If you feel like leaving a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, that would be greatly appreciated. Every little bit helps. It truly does. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening. I'm afraid you just too darn loud.